Okay. Awesome. I think we are up. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren. I'm going to be your host for today's lesson. So I don't know if you guys know this, but 2018 is actually International Year of the Reef. So here at Exploring by the City of Your Pants, we've actually dedicated the first two weeks of October to really trying to celebrate and explore uh, both the beauty, but also the frailty of our reefs. So we have a really awesome speaker with us here today who knows a whole lot about coral reefs. Um, her name is Peggy, and she works with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration all the way in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I know I'm really excited to hear what she has to share with us, and I'm sure you guys all are too. So without further ado, Peggy, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. So I am currently trying to get my screen shared. Can you see that? We can see you, that's great. Perfect. Well, I wanna share with you where I work. I work in Honolulu, Hawaii. This is the building in which I live, but I'll jump into my presentation here. Let me go into present. Um, I'm gonna hide that. Uh, so I just wanna say aloha and thank you for celebrating the International Year of the Reef. Uh, I'm just going to zoom in and share with you a little bit about where I work. I work at NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, like Lauren said. Thank you, Lauren. This is great to be here. Um, so NOAA is an acronym. It stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So I have some visuals here. National meaning that we are in every state in the U.S. within our nation. Oceanic is everything to do with our ocean, from the temperature, salinity, uh, and from our tiny little plants, our plankton in our oceans, to our largest animals uh, like the blue whales. So in our region, this tiny little island archipelago, but we work in a larger region as well. So I look forward to talking to you about corals in this area. The A in NOAA, the first one, stands for atmospheric. So I want you to think weather. Uh, extreme weather, longer periods of weather patterns like climate and looking at climate change. And the last A in NOAA stands for administration. We are under the Department of Commerce. So I have a visual here that kind of has a little bit of smattering of who some of our different groups of NOAA are. So I took this off of our website. Um, NOAA has a NOAA weather service. So we monitor our uh, daily weather uh, in every state. Um, we also are looking at climate, so looking at different temperatures using satellites and different uh, technologies in our oceans and around the globe. Uh, we also are working in coastal areas as well as oceans, so the National Ocean Service. I actually work for the Fisheries Service. Uh, we have satellites. Uh, we do research. We also have a... Um, a marine and aviation group. So we have NOAA Corps officers who drive our vessels or fly our planes. They're our only uniformed office um, here in NOAA. We also do charting, so mapping the sea floor. And we also bring teachers out, um, the teacher at sea program in our fisheries uh, division. We also have sanctuaries and monuments. And I am here representing uh, the education and outreach component. So that's a quick overview. And speaking of fisheries, I come from the state of Washington and I am a salmon people. I am a member of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. And here's a snapshot of some of my family. Um, my mother, Kathy Foreman, is a Puyallup tribal member and my father, Bruce Foreman. Um, this is a picture from a couple years ago, but it is an honor to uh, be here with you. I grew up in Spokane, so far from the ocean. So I want to inspire all of you landlocked students and teachers to understand that we are all connected to this earth. And um, I want to share with that a little bit of uh, today. So currently, if you look at the globe in the upper right hand corner, uh, this is a large Pacific basin part of one ocean, as you well know, I grew up here in Spokane. I now live uh, right here on Oahu uh, in the city of Honolulu. 
And so I wanted to share with you a little bit about our geography. We call these islands the main Hawaiian islands, uh, but we also have what's called the Northwestern Hawaiian islands that are protected under our sanctuaries, under the Papahanao Mokuakea National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, I also wanna share with you that here is another map. We also, four fisheries have field offices in the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, CNMI and Saipan. We also have uh, staff working in Guam, as well as in American Samoa. Uh, there are other marine protected areas like the remote um, Pacific Islands. These um, make up reefs, atolls, and islands that you can see here. So we, we span a great part of the Pacific Ocean. But because I work in Honolulu, um, I will share with you a little bit of what we are doing here uh, locally. So I pulled us back out and I just wanna share with you and inspire you to know that you can reach me in Hawaii at any time and many of our resources. So I wanted to share with you how you might do that. NOAA has their hand in lots of things uh, to do with corals, but many other things as well. Um, our slogan is science, service, and stewardship. So I'll give you, if I could bring all the people that I work with here in Hawaii and bring them into this conference call, I would have. But I have a strategy to share with you a little bit who's working on corals in this area. So I want to introduce you to Paula. Uh, she is one of our scientific divers. And we have had two recent cruises with the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. They had a ramp cruise. RAMP stands for um, research, uh, it's right in this uh, section here. Uh, they're doing an assessment and monitoring. Uh, their program left Oahu and kind of followed this path. So if you wanna learn more about that, check out their website. Uh, we also had another uh, cruise that went out uh, just shortly and returned back to us. And this is just an image from a story map. So it kind of shared the day that they started loading the boat to all their travels in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands to pick up marine debris um, that was in our marine environment and also impacting coral. So um, I work with a wide diverse group of people and I'll continue going. So all those vessels that we man uh, here in the Pacific are, um, we have a group of people known as the NOAA Corps, and I'd like to introduce you to Adrian. Uh, she's one of our senior watch officers. She works with me here uh, in the office. They have time out at sea and also land assignments. And so she is integral to many of our missions um, that we have around uh, our region. Um, I also want to introduce you to Nathan on this side. Uh, Nathan is an oceanographer, so he's really focusing on tsunamis and the impacts um, out here in the Pacific. So whether it's from our buoys, um, we can visualize a lot of those. All the information gets popped up to satellites, and then we can visualize what's going on. So if there's an earthquake on anywhere within the Pacific Basin, we can actually monitor the impacts to where we sit in our region. Um, I have also a picture on the lower part of the screen, which you can see online. We have at NOAA what is called Science on a Sphere. Um, we have one here at our office, but we many of our partners, like the Bishop Museum, and uh, I would encourage you to either go online or find uh, out if you have a Science on a Sphere in your community as well. Fabulous resource to visualize some of the things that are going on around our globe. Next, I want to introduce you to Keith. Uh, Keith actually sits really close to me. He's a fisheries extension agent. He's a rock star. He goes out into the community and he works with fishermen, scientists, as well as managers. He's talking about our regulations, making sure that um, we are not catching fish that are haven't gone through the reproductive cycle. But he's also talking about uh, what is pono fishing, to fishing with responsibility here in the islands um, because many of our coral reefs are habitats uh, it are the habitats for a lot of our uh, fisheries uh, whether they're commercial or international fisheries as well as our nearshore fisheries so having him uh, communicate with these stakeholders and answer any questions he's a great facilitator great problem solver and we're uh, very honored to have him as part of our team uh, next, I'd like to introduce Lani. So Lani actually works on our west 
Hawaii Habitat Focus Area. It's part of NOAA's um, Habitat Blueprint. And so many of our watersheds here in Hawaii um, are divided either in Ahu Puahas, which are land divisions, kind of going back to the monarch days of how these islands uh, were run by kings and uh, the native Hawaiians, the early native Hawaiians. Uh, and looking at a watershed uh, and looking to engage our communities better, Lonnie does a lot of malama aina, or taking care of the earth, a lot of stewardship, conservation, working mauka from up in the mountains down to Makai to the ocean. We often call this ridge to reef. So building resilience in communities and finding ways to support our uh, local agriculture, so food security and water security in the face of climate change are really big issues here in Hawaii. Next, I wanna introduce you to Mark. Mark is our marine debris specialist guru. Um, he also sits here in this office with me. And for those of you who are interested in the impacts of marine debris on corals, there are lots of resources. We have a curriculum online um, at marinedebris.noaa.gov. They have great small videos called Trash Talk, which they're little vignettes that help you think about um, how some of our uh, debris ends up in our oceans. And I also want to put a plug in for him. Uh, every year they put on a calendar art contest. Um, it's nationwide. It just started um, and closes on November 30th. So check out their website again. Um, and K through eight can um, draw pictures to help promote uh, preserving our coral reefs or our ocean environments in regards to marine debris. So check that out. Okay, a few more people I want to introduce you to Gretchen. If you are interested in maps or trying to better understand our geography, she is a, base, a geospatial analyst, excuse me. Um, she's from IAEA. Uh, so on the top of the screen, I have um, one of our data portals um, that is looking at deep sea coral data. So you can actually see some of our different types of coral to say, hey, look at all this orange that we see in the Aleutian chain. Ah, are those the same orange dots that we actually see in the greater Hawaiian islands? What is it about these corals that thrive in these distinctly different uh, environments? So looking at the key, you can actually uh, tab through a lot of that data to better understand what is going on um, in our region. At the lower half of the screen, uh, we also have what's called data in the classroom. Um, this is actually also using a story map, uh, looking at real data, uh, sharing and going through problem solving, looking at data and to interpret of what's going on and have a stronger understanding. Um, and they have different uh, categories, uh, but in regards to coral reefs, they have coral bleaching, sea level rise, water quality, El Nino, just to name a few. Um, so it's very fascinating. And if you ever need support with that, please let me know. Um, I also want to introduce you to Kailani. Uh, he is our Hawaiian cultural resource manager. So bringing the Hawaiian traditional ecological knowledge and sharing that with uh, Western science, he is an integral part of uh, being the liaison and being the voice of the communities here in Hawaii. At the top of the screen, I actually have uh, some of the community in West Hawaii working in a native uh, Hawaiian fish pond. And so they are, looks like they are look, uh, maybe cleaning out the alawai, this channel right here. Um, but it gives you a little bit of the landscape. Um, these fish ponds are very important. Um, historically, as well as providing food for communities, as well as culture. Uh, now we have Barry. Uh, Barry is a hurricane hunter. He also is, uh, flies our planes. And um, I had, this was a stretch of relating to coral reefs, but we just had uh, two close calls with hurricanes. This on the top of the screen is from Tropical Storm Lane. We also shortly thereafter uh, were hit by Tropical Storm Olivia as well. Uh, when those hurricanes were coming towards us, they dissipated obviously, but they can bring extreme weather. Um, 
from storm surges to lots of rain. This is actually the Wailuku River in Hilo, Hawaii. And so all of this brown water enters into our oceans and smothers the coral, not giving light um, to those communities. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So we are very uh, honored that um, our service is looking at safety and preparedness for our communities in the face of some of our uh, extreme weathers. Ah, uh, this is Jane. She is from American Samoa. Uh, she is a meteorologist and very similar to Barry, thinking of all of our uh, different weather patterns that we have here in the Pacific Islands region. We, when you talk about rain, anything that can pick up anything on land, this, it contributes to land-based pollution that enters into our oceans. And looking at the ecosystems of coral reefs, some of that pollution, whether it's sedimentation coming off of lands that don't have vegetation or open fields, but we're also picking up toxins from our streets and our parking lots, uh, pathogens from many of the different animals and things living on land. Uh, and we also get increased nutrients. Anytime we put any nutrients on our land, when it rains, oh, all that stuff comes into our oceans. So there are lots of different ways that you can help and participate that, whether it's you personally or your classroom, your community. Um, so it just gives you a snapshot. I wish I could be there in person with you guys today um, all around the country, but I want to focus a little bit about how NOAA, if you can look through at coral ecosystems through STEM, um, I want to focus on Peggy, we may have lost your microphone here. Can you hear me now? Yep, yeah, you're back on. Oh, oh gosh, good. I'm going to go back in. How am I doing on time? Uh, you are at about 15 minutes. Ah, oh, perfect. So I just wanted to share with you, we have lots of resources, teacher professional development, lots of videos, climate change, ocean acidification, um, coral bleaching things. So lots of things in regards to science, social studies, and really learning about sense of place in our communities and why that's so valuable here. We have lots of technologies, whether it's on land or in under the water. Um, to monitor all of these things. And so we are very excited to share that with you. I'm gonna go back into presentation mode. Um, also engineering and math. So anytime you were out on the water, uh, trying to monitor whether it's an ROV, a drone, um, anything on the vessel to collect these samples has a lot to do with engineering, whether it's propagating young corals um, as a mitigation strategy. And we also have lots of math lots of graphing models to interpret. So these are all the things that inform the, all of the science informs our policy and management so that we can inspire our communities to make a difference and join us in conservation. So I'm a few more slides here. Uh, again, I work for fisheries. So many of our fish in our ocean areas rely on these coral reef habitats. Ahi, also known as tuna, manini, convict surgeon tang. So I have a smattering of some of our near shore fish, but we also have, um, we eat a lot of our commercially caught fish. Um, pokey, pokey bowls are very common here in Hawaii, but also we have two strong um, mandates that when we look at coral ecosystems to protect our fisheries, uh, we have, uh, we work with essential fish habitat and critical habitat. So if there are any endangered species, we wanna make sure that we protect that critical habitat in which they live in. We have a hawksbill sea turtle, green sea turtle, as well as our Hawaiian monk seals. But we have many other endangered species in this area, including some threatened corals. Uh, the essential fish habitat really relies on our fisheries. So in order to protect and create sustainable fisheries, um, our agency does a, a tremendous job of looking at essential fish habitats and consulting with people if they are going to work or change and modify that ecosystem. Um, I want to put a plug in for NOAA Planet Stewards, uh, opportunity for uh, 
schools, teachers, and communities to get involved in stewardship action. You could be a part of the education community or the stewardship doing um, uh, something active in your community to restore um, your land or your area. And you might say, hey, I live in Kansas or Texas or Ontario um, or even Virginia. Um, but all things that you do on land still impact our oceans. Here in Hawaii, we uh, work with schools to build rain gardens to prevent some of that sedimentation from going into our coral reefs. We do marine debris beach cleanups. We remove both invasive algae that are smothering the corals, but we also remove invasive uh, plants as well as animals on land. Uh, for food security, we want to encourage our students to build school gardens, bring back, get your hands dirty, um, and understand how important that is uh, to island living. We often do lots of art uh, to inspire others to learn more, uh, just environmental and ocean and climate literacy. Uh, and then lastly, we work with a lot of our partners to restore our uh, Hawaiian fish ponds. But there's a great website to learn more about that. Uh, so in conclusion, I just wanted to share with you that there are lots of resources. So in my toolkit for educators, I always like to make sure that they are aware that we have many citizen science projects, whether it's from our weather service. In fisheries, we do a lot uh, here in Hawaii, Eyes on the Reef, Opihi. Opihi is another name for limpets. Um, but they are actually bringing students to the near shore and looking at our intertidal zones and collecting data. Um, I've shared with you just some images from uh, videos, story maps, we have lots of games, um, infographics, fact sheets, web stories to give you a little bit more of uh, what we are doing. I am a resource. Again, my name is Peggy Foreman. If you have any questions, I might be able to put you in contact uh, with someone maybe in our region or maybe even somewhere around the country. Uh, we also have grants, internships, and volunteers for students. For those of you who are in high school, we would love to find ways to foster you, whether uh, you are an undergrad or graduate. If you were here in Hawaii, we might consider high school, uh, but we are very honored to um, help you on your career path. To, um, If you are interested in pursuing any of these careers, we'd love to help you along with that. And then I've also spent some time talking about data in the classroom, which is also an online portal that talks about ocean acidification, OA, sorry, that's an acronym, uh, but also coral bleaching and sea level rise. But there's lots more. Please just know that in 20 minutes, I can't cover all of this. But the key to success of looking at coral reef recovery really starts with you and I. Um, I am going to pop out this video for some reason has not been working. But I want to, if you can still see this, um, I want to share this quick video. It's just uh, a minute long. Well, I am going to unshare and uh, chat with you if you have any questions. Um, so I'll do that right now. 
Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Peggy. Um, so I think a couple of our classrooms had to duck out, um, not because you were over time or anything, Peggy, don't worry at all, but we do have a few classes still here. So I'll start with, uh, let's see, Mrs. Cole's class in St. Mary's, Ontario, grade sixes. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you guys. And if someone has a question, please come on up and let us know. Can you try that one more time a little closer to the microphone, please? <laughs> How are you planning um to like recover coral? That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, so our agency obviously works internationally with lots of different partners, but we also uh, work here in our region with our state partners, our city and county partners, uh, as well as a lot of nonprofit organizations. So we look at uh, restoring the habitat as much as we can. We've just banned sunscreen. Um, uh, that will probably take into effect in about in the next year and a half. But when you look at habitat, uh, what some of the great things that we can do are trying to prevent things that are coming into our oceans from land. And so we are um, looking to the landscape and trying to find strategies to remove the sedimentation, the toxins from coming into the water. We're also working with our university partners on super corals, uh, corals that are more resilient to warmer waters that can withstand them. So we take fragments of them, place them on the ocean floor, or on ocean uh, or on coral reefs to see if we can grow new species of corals, which is very exciting so that they can be more resilient in the uh, face of climate change. It's a great question. But it's not easy and uh, we need everyone's help. We need your help. The more people who know about it, um, we can all make a difference. Awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna move next over to, uh, who do we have here? Miss Sullivan's class. If you have a question, go ahead. Hi, okay, sure. Ezra's gonna talk. Hi, Ezra. Hi. Hello, my name is Ezron. I had a question. My question yeah. is, um, my question is, can the coral in the ocean like affect an ecosystem? Can I repeat the question? Can a coral affect an ecosystem? Yes. I'm wondering, like, what animals are Oh, I, I think I know what you're trying to address. So the coral uh, colonies, which are, um, if you can think of jellyfish, they're cnidarians. So like a jellyfish that goes upside down, these are uh, related to uh, jellyfish, but they're connected. They live in colonies. And so all of these animals are home and shelter and provide food for many of the animals uh, in this ecosystem. If you remove or if our uh, coral reefs bleach or are damaged, whether they're from anchors or fins uh, swimming uh, in our areas. Yes, if those get damaged, it takes years and years and years to grow back. If you remove uh, our corals from this ecosystem, uh, it'll impact our fisheries. So we rely on these fish in our oceans for subsistence uh, all throughout the islands. Uh, but also our protected habitat. So we have a lot of protected species like turtles and monk seals um, and other fish that use this area. Um, because of the algae and the sponges that live within these communities, uh, the food web in the coral reef ecosystem is very dynamic. Um, you don't want too much algae because that covers the coral, but there are many fish who rely on sponges or that algae to survive. So it is very dynamic. I Thank hope you. That it, yeah. yeah, I did. I definitely answered it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so if there are any other questions, I think that should, I mean, unless Ms. Sullivan's class has any other questions. Yes, we do. <laughs> Hi. 
Uh, we do, actually. Oh, yeah, great. Go ahead. Okay. Um, no my worries. Name is, hi, my name is Manuel, and I was wondering, um, what is the most common plastic that occurs on y'all's beaches? Oh, that is a great question. I had the honor of going to our marine debris action planning workshop uh, for two days a couple of months ago, and I was had the opportunity to listen to our stakeholders. So we have many really strong uh, partners who uh, interact with communities who are picking up marine debris on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, because I work in fisheries, I was uh, hearing a lot that they are seeing fishing nets. Uh, they were seeing oyster spacers, a uh, lot of monofilament line coming from fisheries, but we also see things that people use on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of straws, single-use plastics plastic bags. Um, because we are so remote uh, in the Hawaiian archipelago, we see a lot of plastics that are degraded. So little bits and uh, pieces, the microplastics. Um, and so we at beach cleanups, which I try and do as often as I can, uh, sometimes we are sifting through the sand uh, with screens and then we shake them, uh, trying to uh, find those smaller pieces of plastic that have degraded. But I would say plastics, whether it's in the form of fishing uh, gear uh, or things that we use on land, all of these things are human problems. Uh, I usually jokingly say, hey, save the humans, uh, because our habits in which we uh, do every day, and I am one of them, um, there are many different ways that you think, oh, I have this um, Starbucks cup and it's disposable. I, I drank out of it once, I put it in a garbage can, but um, you know, winds blow here in Hawaii, uh, birds can come in, we have receptacles for monofilament and we have seen birds come in and take the monofilament out, so things tend to move and because our ocean is so large, we collect a lot of stuff that didn't even come from Hawaii, so it comes all from around the Hawaiian Islands, so it's a really great question. But it's very diverse, and we you'd be surprised at what we do find. That's awesome. Okay, Ms. Sullivan's class has one last question, and I think we'll wrap it up after this. Here's a child here. <laughs> uh, hello. Hello. All right, my name is Jude, and um, I was just wondering, like, what specifically is killing the coral reefs and um, is it more severe depending on which uh, region they are? That is a great question, yes. Um, if you could imagine in Puerto Rico, uh, so you can have natural disasters impact coral reefs, um, whether it is a hurricane or a tsunami, um, earthquakes, you can have uh, human-caused boat interactions, whether it's uh, running aground or dropping an anchor that can kill coral, um, standing on walking, breaking, um, breaking pieces off. Uh, some of those images that I tried to share uh, online, um, a lot of times when I get questions like these, I'm a former teacher, so I'd say, hey, you share with me while I'm killing those corals. Uh, so I like to engage you to continue to find those air, uh, things that impact it. But if you could imagine water that comes from land, picks up and brings a lot of, whether it's sediments um, or toxic chemicals, even things that we flush down the toilet or put down uh, when we're washing our hairs in the shower, all of those chemicals go to sewage treatment plants, but there's still some of those chemicals that are getting into our oceans. So being more thoughtful, uh, A, understanding what are those threats and impacts, and then kind of looking um, to yourself within and saying, hey, are there things that I can be doing better or differently that might help protect our beautiful planet in which we live on? That's, that's a short version of sort of not answering your question, but trying to give it a stab. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Very inspiring stuff. Okay, so we are going to end it here today. Thank you so much to Peggy for being here. And if we could get Miss Sullivan's class to 
give us a big goodbye and thank you. I'm sure Peggy would really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. So nice to meet you.